we go. Yeah, that should be in for in about uh, five seconds or so or less. Here we go. Yay. Alrighty. So we're going to have an interesting class today. Um, there will be lab after the lecture to try to help reinforce the concepts. You know, that's basically the purpose of the lab. Oh, you're welcome. Um, so today's you know, topic is, you know, how does the processor work? And we're going to look into that while we're exploring a few um, important instructions. So I'm just doing something on the side here to bring up LogiSim because, you know, that's we're going to take a look at the architecture and find out, you know, how do we know, you know, oh, actually, I still got a few instances on. So I just have to go back to one of those. And there we go. There we go. All right. So I probably need to uh, get rid of my own webcam little picture in picture because uh, I might need to use the entire screen today. Or I can just move myself to a corner where it doesn't matter. Let me do that. There we go. There. See, this corner is not usually that important, so I can just kind of put myself over here. And always good. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a little busy, um, you know, because I, I try my best to use tunnels to make it look less busy. But once we get, we get used to it, it's not really that bad. So there are a few items that we're going to go through today. I have a little checklist that I made for myself, which is right here. So we're going to talk about the byte, LDI, LD, and ST instructions. We may not be able to finish all three. Um, but, you know, they are similar in many ways. Um, so I might be able to get through LDI and ST, maybe just those two. So let me put a, an emphasis on those two that I really kind of need to get through. So I'll put a little asterisk here and another asterisk over here. Because those two are important. Once we know LDI and ST, LD is like, okay, super duper easy. All right, so we got two more minutes. And it's usually at this point of the class that uh, people will find um, having a beacon tutor to be quite beneficial because um, at this point, there's no modules. You know, I don't really write a whole lot of modules at this point. And that's because the circuit or the uh, processor is quote unquote self-documenting. In other words, if you know how each component works um, and how they work together is something that you can figure out. Now, it doesn't mean you can figure it, figure that out, you know, in just a few minutes. OK, it's going to take some time. But that's basically how you study at this point of time is to really go in and try to figure out you know, how the processor works by looking at the circuit. So there is that. And I just need to answer a question in my text. All right. <clears throat> And obviously, right now, I am also blocking my own pictures, blocking a portion of the screen that is actually useful. But um, you know, I, I'm just going to scroll the screen when I need to get to that point. So, all right, we got 20-ish you know seconds before the class starts, and we are missing. I'm just counting here. I'm not sure how many people are on the YouTube side. There are. A few. There are 12 people on the YouTube side. We're still missing half of the class. <laughs> so combining the uh, Discord side and also the YouTube side, you know, which now has 16 people, we're still only at about one, maybe two, three fifths, like 60% of the class right now. 
but I'm going to get started right away. All right, so we're going to get started. Let me close the window on YouTube because I just need that one to verify that I am indeed streaming and you guys are confirming this streaming already, so I'm good there. All right, so first thing first, um, here's an outline of what I am going to talk about today. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is, you know, um, generally speaking, how do we study this stuff, right? You know, the, the, the toy processor, you know, the TTP. So the first thing is, you know, we, uh, we need to understand how it works. Okay. So I will try my best to explain, you know, like, you know, edge by edge. Okay. You know, remember all the transitions, rising edge and falling edge. So I'm going to try to explain how the processor works uh, from the uh, transitions you know, perspective. Uh, the other way to do this is to start with the components. Now, when I say components, I really you know, specifically want to refer to the registers, RAM, and also the components that can actually do, actually do some calculations. So those would be the components inside the ALU or the arithmetic and logic unit. Um, and those are, you know, these prompts are actually in the questions, you know, channel as well. So if you go to the questions, you know, channel, I already have laid out uh, what kind of question I'm going to quote unquote answer in today's lecture. So we want to uh, figure out what instructions do, like, you know, what is add XY. But today we're not going to talk about add XY. We're going to talk about LD, LDI, and also ST. But it still needs to understand the path between the components. Okay, so, you know, when, when we do a ST instruction, for instance, what components are needed for that instruction? And how are they connected? So the connections are all based on the uh, multiplexers, you know, also known as MUX, and the multiplexers, which are also known as DMUX. So that's why we had a lab that focused on the functionality of MUX and DMUX. Okay, you know, I was trying to get you guys to read the documentation, create the circuit, play with it a little bit, and gain an understanding of how they work. So today we're going to re we'll be relying on that knowledge that you have gained by uh, doing that lab. And today we're going to look into what is an instruction execution cycle. In other words, this is the core of the von Neumann architecture. In other words, uh, we know we are storing instructions in RAM, just like you know we are storing data in RAM. But how does the processor know? where to get the next instruction and what to do once it knows oh this is the instruction of you know a bunch of zeros and ones how does it figure out what it needs to do you know at that point so we're going to be addressing that also in today's lecture and in terms of instructions that i want to go over in class one is called ldi or load immediate and then the next one is st which is just basically store so those are the two main instructions that I want to go over. And we might get into the concepts of a label. Labels are basically just a symbolic name thing, you know, that makes, you know, makes it easier to refer to memory locations. So there is that. <clears throat> so with all of that said and done, uh, we are going to, let me get into my drive because we need to refer to a few documents. And if you want to do the same thing, because all of these are in the shared folder, uh, which means you know you guys can go into those same documents you know along with me, and you can stay at one place when I just kind of move around to look at you know different things. So I think that might be helpful. So the first one is uh, the opcode table. The opcode table is really just a document document that explains. Um, what instructions are available and what they do in a certain way. So that's you know, important. And then the other one that is also important is going to be, I mean, obviously the assembler. Okay, the assembler, <coughs> excuse me, is the tool, <coughs> excuse me, that will convert from, <coughs> excuse me, from mnemonics into the bytes, the op, the opco bytes. <coughs> that we load into RAM. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry about that. I should have uh, muted the mic before I coughed. So that's, uh, you know, so all so we are going to have all of these things open along with LogiSim. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at the ST instruction in the opcode table. 
So in the opcode table, you can just kind of look through uh, column A um, represents the zeros and ones, you know, which is what the processor understands. Column B is referring to the mnemonics, which is a easier way for us to remember which instruction is represented how. Column C is uh, what we call the register transfer language. It is a specific language to describe what is going on in the processor. So what you see here, okay, some of these are flags. Um, you know, yes, we're going to go back to, the, to those concepts that we talked about earlier, like the carry flag, the sign flag, the overflow flag, and the L flag. But most of these are registers. So that's why it's called the register transfer language, or RTL. It describes in a slightly abstract way what is going on in the processor as we execute a particular instruction. And then column D is really just the verbal description of what the, what the instruction is about. <clears throat> so that's basically the bottom line. And in order not to break our attention, because you know, today is going to be a little bit important that we maintain our attention. So what I'll do is I'm going to take row first. And then we'll move on to actually get to um, the concepts. So let me start a new tab. <clears throat> and get to today's date, 2022-0322. There we go. And I will give it um, until, what, 13 minutes, 50? Okay, so six, uh, 5.50. <clears throat> oh, AM is not going to work, is it? PM. And I will let you know the answers first. Pretty sure I remember this one because I just typed it in. So the answer is ALU. I'll put it in the text channel. And then I'll save and publish. So we are taking row, you know, early today just to get it out of the way. And then we can focus on the, the important stuff without, you know, having to take a, uh, a break to take row at that point. All right, so let's go ahead and take uh, take row, and I'm going to get back to um, the circuit first. <clears throat> and then in terms of the notes, okay, in terms of uh, canvas, let me see what would be a good place to get to. I would say go back to my own list of things to talk about today. So this is a reminder for myself, you know, of what we need to talk about. And also the uh, opcode table, because the first one we want to understand is, I'm going to pick ST first, okay? So we'll go ahead and take a look at the ST instruction. So ST is a mnemonic. So we want to look up column B and try to find ST. So if you're in the uh, in the in the spreadsheet, you can do a Control F and then look for whatever you're looking for, like ST. So unfortunately, there are a few words that has ST as the component, but you know we find exactly what we need, which is here. All right. So this is the syntax of using the ST instruction. The parentheses must be around Y, and an X cannot use parentheses. Now this is where um, I have to explain why I teach the class the way that I do. My video is blocking my, my face is blocking, you mean. <laughs> Let me uh, scroll a little bit. There we go. All right, so um, this is where, this is the reason why I teach the class the way that I do. Because if I don't teach the class the way that I do, most people would think it is the syntax of using parentheses around Y that makes Y be the dereferenced register. But that is actually not the case. Um, the parentheses are, for the most part, eye candy. In other words, it just makes it easier for you to understand, to remind you that Y is dereferenced. Okay, so the syntax is more of a, an afterthought. 
as opposed to it dictates, it drives, you know, what is being done. So that's the syntax. Y can be one of the four registers, A, B, C, or D. X can be one of the four registers, A, B, C, or D. And the way it gets the job done or what it does is right here. Let me see if I can uh, bump up the, the magnification so we can kind of just focus on that. There we go. So you can see how, you know, uh, the first notation is the one that I prefer, which is you know, whatever Y points to is going to be changed based on whatever X has. So that's the notation that I you know, choose to use. Now, for those of you who want to look at RAM as an array, which is OK, then Y is the index, you know, to index into the element in the array so that that location or that element of the array of RAM is changed to the content of X. So the second one is not my preference. The first one is, OK, because I just want to look at Y as a pointer. And whatever it points to, the location that it points to is going to be updated with the value of x. So are there any questions about this notation here? Because you know, and, you know, I, I want to make sure that we all understand the notation of what needs to be done before we try to understand what pathways are needed in order for this to happen. So I'm going to pause here a little bit for questions and to address a DM that I received earlier. <clears throat> OK. Um, we are trying to do exactly that whatever. So X and Y are registers. X is one of the four registers A, B, C, or D. Y is one of the four registers A, B, C, or D. And we want to use whatever Y is pointing to. <clears throat> Excuse me. We want to use X, okay? Whatever value is in register X, we want to use that to update whatever Y is pointing to in RAM. That pretty much describes what we are trying to do. Okay. Got it. I'm responding to uh, the DM, you know, but that person is obviously in Discord, you know, listening. So I just want to respond quickly. <clears throat> but is that okay? I mean, is, does that explain what we are trying to do? Because a register can be seen as quote unquote a variable, which it is not. But you know, in terms of trying to term, trying to describe what we want to do, we are basically saying, okay, one of the four registers will provide a value, and then the other register is going to provide an address, and then we're going to go to that address in RAM and then update the value at that location to the value of the first register, which is X in this case. All right, so we got Chris typing. All right, all right, cool, cool. Ah, all right, so I am going to my note here and just basically further refine the notes and I need to switch it to non-dark mode. There we go. <clears throat> all right, so we are going to look at a specific uh, instruction and we'll call this one st let's see uh, b and d over here so this is the instruction that we want to look into which is we are using whatever register d has to update whatever register b is pointing to oh my video is blocking again let me see if this is a little harder because i don't have uh, a lot of content after this so i'm just gonna have to make a bunch of bullet points and see if that helps. There we go. All right. But thank you for letting me know because you know I my eye is usually on you know whatever screen you're looking at, so I'm not looking at OBS, you know, so I, sometimes I won't know that I'm my uh, face is blocking. All right. Very good. <clears throat> All right, so this is what we want to try out, okay? And so we'll start with thinking, okay, so how are we going to get this done, okay? So I'm going to describe here, you know, what we need. So what we need is um, connect uh, register B to uh, RAM.A. 
So this is a notation to basically say, you know, we want register B to connect to the A port of the RAM component because that's how we determine what address uh, or you know, this is how we specify what location in RAM we want to do something about. Uh, we also want to connect register D to RAM.D, which is the D port, the data port of RAM, because that's how we can specify, you know, okay, so you want to overwrite a certain location. What is the content that you want to use to update you know, that location in RAM? That's the job of the D port. So where, what, where, where did we learn this? We learned all of this in last week's labs, okay? Because you'll remember there's a lab that has the RAM as one of the components, ROM as the one of the components. That's how we, that's where we learned this stuff here, or supposedly that's how, that's where we learned this. All right, so after this, we also want to specify, okay, specify <clears throat> uh, RAM.LD and we want it to be a zero because the LD pin of RAM is responsible to choose between a read versus a write operation. So when we specify a read operation, we are reading from RAM. When we specify a write operation, we are writing to RAM. In this case, LD being a zero means we are trying to write to RAM. And once again, if somebody is asking, but how, where, how are we supposed to know this? Well, we're supposed to know this because we actually studied the RAM, the, the reference manual for the RAM component last week. Yes, that was a that was a week ago. But you know, everything stacks up in this class, remember. But I'm re-specifying re all of this stuff here so that we uh, know what we need to do. So the next thing we need to do is to RAM specify RAM.cell equals to one. In other words, otherwise, you know, if cell, if the cell port of RAM is a zero, RAM is not paying attention. It's just dozing off, ignoring everything that connects to its pins. It's like, okay, you know, wake me up when you need me to do something. So having the cell port being a one means we're telling the RAM components like, hey, wake up, you know, we need you to do something. What are we going to do? That's specified by the LD pin. In this case, we're trying to write to a certain location in RAM. What location? That's specified by RAM.A, the address port. And what is the actual content that we want to use to update that location? That's up to RAM.D, because that's the data port. Yeah, so cell is kind of like enable, except, you know, in... I mean, those two terms are usually kind of interchangeable when we describe components. And I think RAM just used, you know, cell. Let me just double check and make sure, because I don't want to give you incorrect information. So you can see this cell here. It does the same thing as EN or enable. <clears throat> Select, you know, is kind of the same thing. Well, in this case. All right. So what else do we need to do? Well, what we need to do next is the last thing. Okay. You know, because you, if you remember when we try to update a register or a D flip-flop, we need an edge, right? You know, the clock pin needs to have an edge. So we need a rising edge at RAM dot. Now this one is kind of tricky because it's, it's actually not named. Uh, the clock pin simply is represented by um, a little triangle. So it's not actually named the clock pin, but it is the clock pin. So we need a rising edge at the clock pin of the RAM component to finish the entire operation. We, we, that's, that's basically the, the last event that we need in order to update uh, the RAM component. All right, so all of these things we need to do, but what, I, what we're gonna do first is to try to analyze how do we make that path, right? You know, from B, register B in the register bank to RAM.A, and how do we at the same time connect register D to RAM.D? Okay, so the process of analyzing the path, you know, is pretty much reusable. Okay, you know, so even though we are very specifically trying to figure out one single instruction now, but the approach of doing this is the same, you know, regardless of which instruction we are trying to analyze. All right, so the first thing we need to do is to say, okay, so we need, we know the registers are inside the register bank, which is in here. 
So we go into the register bank by right clicking on the register bank and then select view register bank. And now we can see register A, B, C, and D. So we want register B to connect to the A port of RAM. So somehow we need this wire or this node to eventually connect to uh, the A port of RAM. So obviously, we at this point we can say, well, we can use you know reg reg out zero or register output zero, or we can use register output one. So these two are output pins of the register bank as a component. But at this point, we don't know which one is going to you know, which one has a potential of connecting to the A port of RAM. So we kind of have to zoom out first and find out. Okay, so here's the RAM component. This is the A port of RAM. And we run into a multiplexer right away. It's like, OK, so how do we make this connection? So the way we analyze this is to say, OK, which one has a potential of connecting to the register bank? So we look at this one here and go like, mm, no, I don't think so. Right. I mean, this one does not seem to have any way to connect to the register bank. And we look at the other one. It does not directly connect to a register bank. It does connect to a demultiplexer, which then connects to output one of the register bank. So that means this one is the one that we want. So right away, we can say, oh, we want ADDR mux to be what again? So I'm going to let you guys you know, tell me what we need um, ADDR mux to be in order to connect input zero to the output of this specific multiplexer. So this is a question for you guys to answer like right now. So in order to answer that question, you kind of have to remember what a multiplexer is and how it works, right? So a multiplexer is a multiple input single output device and it is a switch to, you know, to basically say which of the input connects to the output. So in this case, Mark and Omer are correct. And so is Vincent and Dylan, <laughs> because we want input zero to connect to the output port. So ADDR mux need to be a zero. OK, so we're going to go back to my note here <clears throat> and you know basically just kind of record it. Because eventually, we're going to, so in order to get this done, OK, so we want uh, in order for this to happen, we need AD, ADDR box needs to be a zero, not a one, but it needs to be a zero. So I, what I'm doing here is I'm documenting, okay, what do I need in order to establish the, the, the right pathway and to configure RAM the way that I'm supposed to over here. All right, so we got one mystery solved. So now we need to solve some additional mystery because this is a demultiplexer, which is a device that has one single input but multiple output. So the question now is, what do I need to do about R0, R01DMUX? This is the selector of which output gets the input for this specific demultiplexer. So we already know that we need it to connect to output zero. So zero again, very good. Okay, so you guys are getting it. 89, sure. <laughs> so we know it's going to be zero. All right. So I'm going to document it, you know, on uh, in my note. You're not going to see it, you know, because I'm just writing it here. So register um, output one DMX needs to be a zero. So I'm going to show you as soon as I, I'm done typing. So there we go. So now I'm recording that I also need this tunnel of register output R uppercase O one DMX for DMUX, you know, to be a zero. That's just a name of a tunnel. So this way, you know, I don't need to track everything all the way back to the ROM, you know, and everything has a name that kind of suggests, you know, what it needs to do. All right, so we have just tracked everything down to output one of the 
uh, register bank component. So now we can really look into the register bank component because we track everything down to this output pin. So now we look at this output pin and we ask how do we connect this node to this node over here because that's the output of register B. So what do you think we need? I mean, we you're, you're looking at it, right? You know, this is this is what we need. So we need a zero one. That is correct. But what do, what needs to be a zero one? Because a zero one here is going to make this multiplexer connect to the output of register B, and a zero one over here is going to make this multiplexer connect to register B. So we need register out one cell, not out zero cell, because one is out zero and the other one is out one. So we want out one cell to be zero one. Okay. So you guys are, Bernard is close, um, just missing that, you know, zero versus the one and then Vincent is correct about that. All right. So we're going to document it, right? So it's important to make sure that we document all of this stuff here because eventually this is how we are going to specify uh, some of the components in the ROM. Um, so it's important to do this. So now we get back to the circuit because the outside name is a little bit different because what we want to do is this is register output one select. So instead of giving it the complete name, you know, there's no space here for the entire name. So register output is just R upper, uppercase O. So we will say register output one cell equals to zero one in base two. All right, so let me switch back to the notes here so that you can see what I mean by that. So I use you know two in parentheses to emphasize that zero one is in base two and register output one cell is the name of the tunnel that we need to specify you know a bit pattern of zero one. So are we doing okay so far? Oh yeah, phone keyboards, you know, um, yeah, phone keyboards won't work very well with uh, with this class. <laughs> The spell check is going to go crazy, you know, you know, when we're trying to specify these tunnels. All right, so that answers one of the questions originally. So now we're going to try to answer the other question, right? You know, so this is how we connect register B to RAM.A. So now the next question is to answer how do we connect register D to RAM.D? <sighs> okay, so let's go ahead and check that out. So typically, I start with RAM.D and find out you know, where it connects to. And as it turns out, it connects to a lot of things, right? But we want to look at the one that potentially would connect to the register bank, okay? So the node that, that is of interest is this one here, okay? So this is the wire that we are interested in because it comes out of a demultiplexer where the input is coming out of the output zero of the register bank. So this is the one that we are interested in. Now, this demultiplexer is different from this demultiplexer here in the sense that it has an enable. So the first thing we need is to specify register output zero enable needs to be a one because otherwise the demultiplexer is turned off and it's not gonna output anything. So that's the first thing that we need to do. I'm typing on the side into my notes um, and then I'll show you when it is all done. So register output zero. So the first is an uppercase O, the second is a zero. EN needs to be a one. All right, so now I'm done typing. I'll show you what I have here. So this is the first thing we need to do is to turn on that uh, the multiplexer. Then the second thing we need to do is to hook up the connection. So we want this input to connect to this output over here. So what do you think register zero DMX or D multiplexer needs to be? And Vincent is correct. It is one zero in base two. Very good. So I'm just typing this on the side. Register output zero DMX needs to be z one zero in base two. Now this time, you know, the uh, base two thing is really important because of, because otherwise it can look like a 10 in base 10. So that's why, you know, having a base two here is really crucial because now we understand, oh, this is one zero in base two, it is not 10. 
Cool. So now we find a way to connect this node here that is highlighted to this node over here, which is just coming straight out of the register bank. So now we need to look into re the register bank again and say, OK, so how do we get this to connect to that? So once again, the question is, how do we get this to connect to that? So this is the multiplexer. So that means the selector of the multiplexer needs to be 1-1. One, one. OK, very good. So Ian, Dylan, and Vincent are all correct. It has to be 1-1 one, one in base 2. Yes, very good, Ian. Very good, in base 2. So I'm just going to write this down on the side. Uh, we need, um, let's see, register output 0, register output 0. Um, cell select to be 1-1 one, one in base 2. Very good. And let me show you what I have here. There you go. All right. So now we go back to the circuit, to the main circuit. And we say, OK, so I think we got all the things hooked up at the right places now. So the next question is, what about all of these control signals to the RAM component? OK, so because we got a whole bunch of stuff here that, you know, that will help determine what the RAM is supposed to do or where, the, where they should even do something or not. So the first one is RAM cell, which is easy because RAM cell needs to be a 1. OK, so in order for RAM cell to be a 1, we just specify the tunnel of that name to be a 1. So RAM cell needs to be a 1. And let me switch back to the note so you can see what I'm typing here. So as it turns out, the RAM cell is just you know named after RAM cell. <laughs> so it's that's an easy one. And RAM load is the same thing too. So we have RAM load LD equals to Oh, there's an ant on my table. Uh, this needs to be a zero because we want to specify a write operation. And finally, we just need the clock to go from 0 to 1. So this is the system clock. This is, there's only one single clock for the entire system. So this is the system clock, and it needs to go from 0 to 1. And that finishes you know, the specification of what we need to do. All right, so when you look at the clock pin here, this is the clock pin. So once you, you highlight this note, you can see the same clock is going into all of the registers. OK, so we have a PC, which is a register. It connects to the same clock line. Um, we have a flex as a register. It connects to the, to the clock line. So they're all connected to clock. Why is LD01? LD is not supposed to be 0, 1. It's just uh, 1. So that was a typo on my part. It is supposed to be a 0. And I pressed the wrong key on my keyboard. It's supposed to be a back tick, but I typed 1 instead. So good job spotting my typo. It is supposed to be just 0. Thank you. All right. So that's it, right? Yeah, so this is, this is what it takes to store the content of register D to the location in RAM that register B is pointing to. And of course, you guys are going like, OK, so uh, can you show me you know, having the processor actually doing this? And the answer is, obviously, because that's kind of the whole point of this thing, right? So this is still holding a program from last time. So we're going to de delete this program. And to do that, all you have to do is to go to sim uh, simulate and reset simulation. So that will clear all the content in RAM, and clock is going back to a dark line. So the first thing we need to do is to specify that opcode, okay? Yeah, because you can't really just change the tunnels because the tunnels all connect to the ROM, okay? So the output of the ROM is where all the tunnels you know get their values. So what we need to do is now to figure out what is the opcode corresponding to the one that we just described. So that can be figured out you know, manually by going to the opcode table. So we want Y or YY to be specifying register B, which is a 0, 1. 
we want xx to be 1 1 because that is supposed to register uh, that's supposed to specify register d so the entire opcode is going to be 1 1 1 1 which is an f in hexadecimal and then followed by 1 1 0 1 which is let me see 1 1 0 1 is a d in hexadecimal so fd is uh, the hexadecimal representation of the opcode that we are interested in so I can go through the assembler to do this. Well, let's actually go through the assembler to do this, just in case I make a stupid mistake somewhere, right? So we'll go ahead and specify ST in parentheses B and then comma D. So we are storing whatever register D has into whatever register B is pointing to. And then we go straight to assemble and make sure that you know we figure out the, the opcode correctly. Yep. Okay, so we got the opcode done correctly. Excellent. So now we can, now you can, if you want to, go to RAM file and go through all that trouble to download and then put it and load it into RAM. But since it's really just one or two bytes, I might as well just kind of poke the RAM component and directly program the RAM with that content. So all you have to do is to make sure that you're using the poking tool and then you poke at the right location. Now you're not, you cannot poke at all the locations. It just it just turns out that you know uh, location zero zero, which is where the program starts, is always you know always displayed. You know it's always the first one. So the other way to do this is to right click and then you go to edit content. And once you do that, you know I'm gonna uh, move the window into your view. So now you have visibility of all of the locations. Then you can do the same thing. Just click on the one that you want to change. And then you just over type it with FD. That's exactly what I did. And then the next location, we want it to be a 01. It's not really important at this point, but 01 is the halt instruction. It stops, you know, from, it stops the processor from going to further locations to try to execute more opcode. So once this is done, we can close this window and now we can start to execute the instructions. So right now we are making a transition. So instead, well, okay, not instead, but after we have specified, you know, the connectivity between the components and how we want to configure RAM. So now what we're trying to do is to figure out, okay, but how does the, how does the processor get this done, right? And the other thing we want to do here is kind of to change the registers a little bit because otherwise we'll be storing 00 to location 00 which is also where the opcode is. Uh, so we are turning this program into a self-modifying program which is not a good idea. So we want to change register B not to point to location 00 but a location that is not going to be used in this program. Let's say it's 05. Okay so we're going to change this to location 05. So location 05 is going to be changed instead of location 00 and you know just overwriting a location that already has the content of 00 to a new content of 00 is hardly exciting and we can't even tell whether it's working or not so we're going to change register d which specifies the new content or new value at location 05 to something other than 00 um we will go ahead and specify 7c okay yeah. don't ask me why it's just random okay so we are going to change location 05 in ram to a new content of 7c with this configuration in the registers all right so are we ready to go or are there any questions about how this is set up because you know if there are still questions about how this is set up, we should address those questions first. Once those questions are all addressed, then we'll go ahead and actually um, look at how this is going to work. So while you guys are coming up with the questions, I am going to show you a picture just so that you understand what the TTP is and what I'm trying to do here. So I'm going to look at V8 engine model. There we go. And we'll take a look at a picture. So we go to shopping. Was that shopping? All right. So some of you, you know, in your childhood, you might have wanted, like me, you know, your parents to buy you a an engine model. 
Um, some of these are transparent, like this one here. Okay, this is a really kind of particularly cool one. It is transparent, so you can actually rotate, hand rotate, you know, the um, these pulleys, and actually get to see how the pistons you know, move and how the crankshaft you know, turn, and then in return, it will bump the the valves you know up and down, you know, to let. Uh, the fuel air mixture in or let the exhaust gas to get out and so on and so forth okay that is what the TTP is about okay the TTP is basically a model of a much more complex high performance engine but it is a model in the sense that you can it's transparent everything you can see okay you can turn the crankshaft now there's no crankshaft to actually turn it is equivalent to transitioning the clock okay every time the clock transition from zero to one or transition from one to back to zero that is kind of like rotating the crankshaft of a model engine just a little bit so you can see what it is going what it's doing to the piston what it's doing to uh, the crankshaft and in return you know how the valves are opening and closing and stuff like that all right so I'm getting back to the text channel <laughs> 8k4 uh, that's 700 bucks for a model <laughs> yes but the to but t tax toy processor is free yeah that's pretty hard to beat okay fine you guys some of you pay for uh, tuition fees and whatnot but it's still a pretty good deal I think it's a pretty good deal all right <clears throat> okay so now that we know what TTP is let's turn that crankshaft right so the crankshaft is uh, is the clock pin. So the way we quote unquote turn the crankshaft is to uh, is to type uh, control control T. Okay. But before we turn the crankshaft, we want to know at the very beginning what is the state right now, and you know what's going to happen when we turn the crankshaft just a little bit. So the key of you know kind of what is orchestrating you know the operation of the entire processor is this portion of the processor okay so this portion of the processor is where we start so when we have the first rising edge because clock is low at this point and the next transition is going to be a rising edge so we want to find out which register is going to do something because most registers are going to be sensitive to a rising edge. There's only one exception to that rule, which is the microcode pointer. So the microcode pointer is the only one that is sensitive to a falling edge. All of the other registers are sensitive to a rising edge. So since the clock is currently low, so when I type control T, you know, it's going to be a rising edge. But most of the registers are disabled. They're not paying attention right now. So if you look at the program counter, the program counter is not enabled because EN is connected to a dark green wire and that's how we can tell it's a zero. But if you're not convinced, you can always click on it and see that it is actually a zero. Um, so we want to find out what is actually going to be active, right? You know, so if you look at the uh, flex register, same thing. EN is a zero. Um, and when you look at every single register in the register bank, they are all, you know, having, they're not enabled, okay? None of them is enabled. You can always just make sure, right? Right click, go to view reg bank, and you can see how every single one of them has E and being off. And that really has to do with the decoder is actually disabled as well. All right. So nothing seems to be paying attention except for one register. The one single register that is paying attention is the instruction register. So here's the instruction register. You can see how EN is a one here. And now the question is, every single time you know, a register is enabled and you're going to have a rising edge, what do you think is going to be your next question? So we know a register is going to be updated because it is enabled. And we're going to have a rising edge, which is providing the timing of which instant of time is going to update you know the registers the register is going to update its content so what do you think is a natural question to ask next exactly what does it update to or what is providing the value 
that is going to be used to update the register. Okay, very good. Okay, so to do that, we just have to follow the wire, follow the wire that connects to the D port. And you go like, oh, no, this is bad because it connects to a whole bunch of stuff. Well, but out of this whole bunch of stuff, most of these are disabled or it does not specify an output. So if you look at these two connections here, they are connecting to the input of a multiplexer, which means they, they cannot be specifying a content on this node. So this one here does output because it's coming out of a demultiplexer, but this demultiplexer is turned off because register output zero enable is off. Um, let's see, where else does it connect to? Um, 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 it connects to this output pin. Output pins never you know, specify the content on the wire. So the only thing it can that can possibly specify you know, something to this particular D port here is RAM. So now we look at RAM and go like, okay, are we really sure this RAM component is actually outputting something at the D port? Let's double check, right? So we can see RAM cell is a one. So yes, the RAM component is awake. It is paying attention. RAM load is also a one, which means we are in a read, we, we are specifying a read operation. So that means, you know, the D port is going to reflect whatever the address port is addressing, which turns out to be location zero zero so what would be the next uh, question to ask now that we know that the output of RAM or the D port of RAM is specifying the content that will be used to update the instruction register what do you think is the next natural question to ask now that we know it's coming out of RAM It has something to do with, all right, so I'll, I'll wait until Millie is done typing because I'm, I, have a, I have a hunch that you guys already know what the answer is. So now that we know the D port of RAM is specifying the content of what's going to be used to update the instruction register, what is the next natural question? Um, not so much that, okay? So where the instruction register is going to is not really that important at this point because right now we are going to update the content of the register. We know it is coming out of RAM but one question should we, we should be asking right now because we know it is coming out of RAM, but there's one important question that we have not answered at this point. It has to do with the RAM component. The question has to do with the RAM component. All right, so I'm gonna answer my own question now. <laughs> um, we know it's addressing location zero zero, but why? Okay, that is the question. Okay, what is specifying location zero zero right now? That is the question. So to answer to answer that question, we follow the A port all the way back to this multiplexer, and in this multiplexer, we know that the selection is a one, which means input one is connected to the output of this multiplexer, right? So we now track down input one. And input one is coming out of the program counter. PC stands for program counter. So the program counter is actually a very important piece inside the processor because it specifies where do we get the next opcode. That's the job of the program counter. Okay. So now we have a pretty good picture, right? You know, because the instruction register is getting whatever the, whatever the program counter is specifying. Now, this is called the fetch cycle, okay? The moment we have a rising edge, this is called the fetch cycle. So let me go back to my notes here, okay? And you guys really should be taking notes at the same time, or at least you're make, marking the time of when I specify these things. So now we are specifying the fetch cycle, and the way that I'm going to describe the fetch cycle is uh, we want, let's see here, 
we want the instruction register so I'm gonna just use instruction register here to be updated by whatever the program counter is pointing to that is the fetch cycle Uh, the program counter increments at some point. Okay, it doesn't really increment the opcode, it increments itself so that we'll be ready to fetch the next instruction. But it's not happening just yet. Okay, it, it, it will happen in the next rising edge. So Ian is, is asking a very good question. It's just not happening yet at this point. Okay, so the fetch cycle is you know the moment of time when the instruction register gets whatever the program counter is pointing to in the RAM component. All right, so switching back to the, the model, right, the engine model here. So now what we want to do is to give it a rising edge. We are turning that crankshaft just a little bit just to see, you know, okay, what's going to happen next. And the anticipation is the instruction register is going to get whatever is at location 00, zero right now, which is FD. So we are expecting the instruction register to update to FD at this point. So here I type Control T on the keyboard, and sure enough, that is what is changed. Excellent, right? So now the next cycle is a falling edge. Nobody pays attention to the falling edge except for the microcode pointer. So the microcode pointer is the only register in the entire processor that pays attention when we have a falling edge. So the microcode pointer is going to be updated when I con when I type control T again on the keyboard. So what so once again what is the next question? You know, now that we know the microcode pointer is going to update because it's always enabled and we're going to have a falling edge. So what is the next natural question to ask? I think some of you are getting the hang of this already. Exactly. Who is specifying the new content of this register, right? So we want to track down the D port because the D port is how we specify the new content in you know when it's enabled and we have the right kind of edge. And it comes straight out of a multiplexer. So what do we do now? It's coming out of a multiplexer. So what do we do? <clears throat> Uh, yes, so D port is the data port. It basically is the same thing as the D pin of a D flip up. All right, so what, how do we figure this out? Because it's coming from a multiplexer and with any type of multiplexer, it has multiple inputs. So how do we know which input we should be paying attention to in this case? The select pin, right, exactly. So the select pin of the MUX, <coughs> excuse me, tells us you know which one of the input we, we, we should try to track down so since this is a one that means input one connects to the output of this multiplexer so we should track down this node here <coughs> excuse me so now we are tracking this wire and it's coming out of an adder okay this is an adder if you click on it <coughs> excuse me if you use a select tool and click on the adder, it shows you it's an adder. It's a 12-bit adder, okay? So there's a reason why it's a 12-bit adder, but that's kind of besides the point at this point. So with an adder, we want to find out, okay, what is it adding? Well, one wire, one of the input, connects to a constant of zero. So you're going to say, but tech, it's kind of pointless to add zero to something. And what are we adding a zero to? We're adding a zero to the output of the register. Okay, that doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense until you pay attention to the carry in. So carry in is basically the same thing as our K0 when we talk about binary addition. Yes, that was a while ago, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yep, and this is why I said, you know, everything stacks up in this class because, you know, they're all related. So we are basically adding one to you know, the microcode pointer. So the output of the microcode, uh, blah, the output of the adder at this point should be 001. So sure enough, we see 001. So, th so basically we are taking the current value of the microcode pointer, add one to it, and then use that to update the microcode pointer itself. In other words, we're simply incrementing the microcode pointer. So in register transfer language, okay, you know, this is what we are doing. 
Okay, so this is kind of in between, you know, meaningful things. But if you want to, you know, we can kind of make it a part of the fetch cycle. So we are basically just incrementing the micro code, micro code pointer. There we go. Uh, I use U here because U is very close to mu, which is the symbol that we use for micro. So U code pointer is actually a micro code pointer. All right, so that's what we are expecting the processor to do. Nothing else is going to change because no, nobody pays attention to a falling edge except for the micro code pointer. So here comes a control T. I'm typing control T now. And we can see, aha, okay, so the micro code pointer is incrementing to 001. And we can see how the content of the ROM is changing because, you know, the address um, pin of the ROM is is connected to the micro code pointer. So it was at location 000, but now it is at location 001. All right, so what are we going to do next? Okay, so same thing, right? We analyze all the components because we are about to have a rising edge now. So we want to know what is going to be updated when we have this rising edge. The instruction register is not paying attention because its EN is a dark green, which is a zero. Ah, the program counter is going is enabled. So once a, so now that we know the program counter is going to be enabled, what is the next question? I mean, you guys, some of you has you know, has have to be some of you has to be tired of this question by now, but I'm going to ask it anyway because it's important. So now that we know the uh, the program counter is going to be updated, uh, what is the next question? So PC is going to be updated. And what do, you, what do you think is going to be the question? Well, it's the same question. Every time something is going to be updated, we want to ask the question, what is it going to be updated with? Okay, what is the new value and who specifies that value? So that's what we're going to do next is to track down what is connecting to the D port of the PC or the program counter at this point so that we can tell how it's going to be updated. So we track down the D port and just like you know the other register here, it comes from a multiplexer, except this multiplexer is now having a select of a zero, which means the input zero is connected to the output. And we see a very similar type of uh, mechanism here. We have an adder and the input of the adder is coming from the program counter itself. So, and the constant, the other value that we are adding to the program counter is zero, except the carry in or K zero is a one. So we are basically adding one to the current value of the program counter. So this kind of answers, um, let me see whose question it was earlier. Um, <laughs> I cannot remember. It's going back, 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 back. Somebody mentioned something about incrementing a register. And this is this is what we are doing now. We are incrementing the program counter. All right, so getting back to my notes. So now we know how the program counter is going to be updated. It is simply incremented. So you can you can write it like this. You can also see you can also say PC plus plus or plus plus PC. Kind of all the same. Okay. All right, so getting back to the processor, back to the processor. There we go. All right, so now we're about to have a rising edge. So we'll go ahead and make sure that we observe that the program counter goes from 0, 0 to 0, 1. So here comes the control T, click. Ah, OK, so the program counter increments from 0, 0 to 0, 1 because we have already fetched whatever is at location 0, 0. So we don't need the program counter to point to location 0, 0 anymore. We're advancing the program counter. So now it's ready to grab whatever is next to execute. OK, so that's why we increment the program counter. So now we're about to have a falling edge. So with a falling edge, it's very easy because only one register is sensitive to a falling edge, and that's our microcode pointer. So we're going to do the same analysis, right? You know, where's the D port connected to, you know, with uh, our microcode pointer? It's coming from the multiplexer. Okay, that part has not changed. Okay, same boring question. However, this time, the selector is no longer specifying a 1, so we are not incrementing 
the microcode pointer. Instead, we are using input zero to specify the new value of the micro microcode pointer. So now, the interesting thing is, um, we got a tunnel, and that tunnel is just connecting to the output of the instruction register, and then we have this splitter thing, which is in a reverse direction. So you can we can we can call this a merger, because the 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 side that is providing the value is the split end, and then the side that is taking the value is the merged end. So let's take a closer look here, because you're going to need to take a closer look to find out what is happening with. <clears throat> The, the splitter. So let's go ahead and take a closer look. There we go. So this part here is really the same eight bits that are coming from the instruction register. And they are going to be specifying bit 4 to bit 11 of whatever the merged end is connected to, which is basically the microcode pointer. But what about bit 0 to bit 3? Bit 0 to bit 3 are basically connected to a constant of 0. So what are we doing? We are basically splicing here, okay? So we are basically saying, okay, so we need to specify 12 bits because the microcode pointer has a D port, uh, has a D port that is 12, 12 bit wide. So the multiplexer also is also 12 bit wide. So whatever is going into one of the inputs, each one of the input of the multiplexer also needs to be 12 bit wide. But to specify 12 bits, we are now splitting the 12 bits into two groups. The least significant four bits are always going to be zeros. The most significant four bits are coming right out of the instruction register. Now, this is very important because now we are using, okay, let me zoom out a little bit here. This is a very important part of the execution cycle because what we are trying to do is to use whatever value is here to basically specify the most significant two digits of the three hexadecimal digits of the microcode pointer. We are, in a sense, dereferencing the instruction register into a location of ROM. All right. So the adder is 12 bit wide because everything is 12 bit wide because the ROM is 12 bit wide when it comes to the A port. So when you go to when you look at the ROM here, <clears throat> you can see how the ROM has 12 bits for the A port for the address bit width and the output is 26 bit wide, which means the D port is 26 bit wide. All right, so we are now expecting the microcode pointer to get a value of what? Okay, I'm going to let you guys figure this out and then I'll do the control T. Okay, what is going to be the new value of the microcode pointer when I type control T on the keyboard for the next falling edge? And Ian is correct. It's going to be FD0. Okay, so let's go, let's go ahead and do a control T. And sure enough, it becomes FD0. And as a result of that, and as a result of that, um, the location FD0 is now selected from this ROM. Now, this ROM is always enabled because cell is connected to a constant of 1. So whatever is at the location specified by the A port is instantly available at the D port here. So this is where we can check. Okay, you know, this is um, okay. Let me go back to the note here because I need to specify what the decode cycle is actually doing. So let's see, where's my cursor? Cursor is right here. All right. So the decode cycle is basically getting doing something like this. The microcode pointer is getting and um, in the instruction, whatever is in the instruction register, left shifted four bits. So less than less than is a left shift operation, which is basically introducing four additional zeros on the right hand side and shifting all of the other bits to the left hand side by four positions, which is accomplishing exactly what we saw in the simulator. Okay, you know, the the value of FD as in hexadecimal becomes FD zero in hexadecimal because one zero in hexadecimal translates to zero 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 in base two. Alrighty.
And the decode cycle is very important because this is how we update the ROM component to point to a very specific location that will tell the processor how to make connections between its components. All right, so Ian is typing and um, we'll go ahead and uh, answer those questions before we move forward to analyze how the processor is currently configured. And the time is 6.35-ish, so I think we are good in terms of time. All right, does the ROM contain a set of static instructions of how the processor handles opcode instructions? Yes. So when you look at this kind of seemingly random you know, content of at location FD0, this specifies exactly what we determined earlier. In other words, it specifies exactly uh, what we're, when, oh, right there. So it's going to specify exactly this, okay? The address mux is going to be a zero, uh, register output one dmux is going to be a zero. Register output one cell is going to be a zero one, and blah 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 blah. Okay, so let's go ahead and double check. Okay, so we are now going to double check and see that all of those things are the way we specified earlier. So I'm going to start with RAM. RAM is selected. Yes, you know we did specify. Okay, so let's go back to my note here. So we did specify that RAM needs to be selected right here. So that's done. And we want to specify RAM load to be a zero. It is indeed a zero. The clock is right now a zero, but the next transition when I type control T is going to be a rising edge. So the rising edge thing is taken care of as well. Let's look at a RAM mux, I mean ADDR mux. Okay, so ADDR mux according to my note here is it needs to be a zero. Okay, so let's see whether it is a zero or not. We can see right here it is indeed a zero. What else do we need to specify? We need to specify a whole bunch of stuff with related to the register banks, right? So we, let's go back to my note here. Register output zero EN or enable needs to be a one, and it is indeed a one. Register output, um, register output one DMUX needs to be a zero. Register output one DMUX is indeed a zero. And let me switch back to the poking tool so it reflects the value. Right there. Okay, so we get our zero. <clears throat> uh, register output one select needs to be a zero one. So let's double check that. Register output one select. And this one may or may not work. It, okay, it does work. Okay, it is zero one. Um, register output zero DMUX needs to be a one zero. Register output one uh, DMUX is this wire. It needs to be a one zero. So that is indeed the case. Register output zero cell or select needs to be a one one. And we're going to double check that. And oh, this one is hard to click. But yes, it is clickable. It is indeed one one. So this is how the processor how all the components get connected because somebody is quote unquote pulling the strings and the one who's pulling all the strings is the ROM okay so the ROM is the puppet master okay let me go back to the uh, thing here so the ROM is the puppet master because all of those tunnels eventually you know, are coming from the D part of ROM, of ROM. So the D part of ROM connects to a whole bunch of stuff here. It connects you know, directly to RAM cell and RAM load. So those two are pretty easy to tell. But it also connects to U code data or micro code data. This is really wide. And that thing is right here. Okay, And then it further splits into all of these little tunnels here. So we just saw a bunch of tunnels that we referred to earlier, which is register output zero enable, register output zero cell select, register output zero DMUX, uh, register output one select, register output one DMUX. That is how the processor decodes an opcode. So in, in other words, an opcode is really just a byte, okay, eight bits sitting in RAM somewhere. And it is uh, specifying basically a location, essentially specifying a location in the ROM. And that location of the ROM 
is actually basically specifying all of those individual bits that we need in order to configure all the multiplexers, all the demultiplexers, all the decoders, um, the enable of the registers, the enable of the RAM, the RAM load versus you know, store, and so on and so forth. Those are all coming from the location of ROM. One single location of ROM specifies all of those things. So that is how an instruction executes. Okay. So now that we understand that you know the the analysis that we did earlier, which you know results in all of these bits here, we are now making all the connections already. Okay. In other words, register B of the register bank is connected to the A port of RAM. Register D is connected to the D port of RAM. And all that is missing is the rising edge. Okay. Because once we have the rising edge, the registers inside the reg one register in the register bank. No, I take it back. Sorry, I take it back. I take it back. It is the RAM that is going to update. Okay, but you can double check it, right? You can you can use the poking tool and say, okay, what is the new content of this location? Seven C. What location is getting changed? Location zero five, and it is highlighted. Okay, so all that is missing at this point is a rising edge. All right, so I'm going to wait for Ian's uh, text before I type Control T to confirm that the operation is going to occur exactly the way we need it. All right, so in terms of programming ROM, would the pr would would be the program library and updating a location in RAM would be like function call. Sort of. Okay, so you can kind of look at each location of RAM as a function call, and then the function definition would be defined by the content in ROM. So you can kind of look look at it that way, yes. Um, and that's also partially why you know this content here is called microcode, because it is not just code. Now what is code? What is opcode? Opcode goes into RAM, but each opcode can potentially translate to multiple locations in microcode. And then each microcode itself specifies a whole bunch of bits in order to basically pull all the strings necessary to establish the connections between all the components in the processor. Are we doing okay so far with this? I know this is a lot of stuff to take in, and that's why you probably need to review. Um, the lecture and your notes. I hope you guys are taking notes along the way because there's no way you know anyone can absorb all this material just by you know listening to me when I'm presenting. Okay, I shouldn't say no way, but you know very few people can do that. I'll just put it that way. <clears throat> all right. Yeah, so definitely take notes because, you know, I cannot, I mean, everything that I speak, everything that I'm doing on screen, those are all recorded. What is not recorded are your thoughts, are your own understanding and your own connection between all the different concepts. That I cannot, that's, that, there's no way for me to say that. I'm not a mind reader and I cannot read 50 minds at the same time, assuming there are 50 people actually paying attention right now. So... That's something that you need to do is to take notes, okay? Because your own thoughts are very important and it's important to document that so that you can go back in time and go like, okay, I wrote this because I got an understanding of blah, 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 and so on. That is a very important step in taking a class like this. Um, where the, Okay, so that goes back to the explanation of the splitter or the merger, right? You know, because, you know, the merger here is getting bit 0 to bit 3 from a constant of 0, and then the instruction register is providing bit 4 to bit 11. So I want you to use a spreadsheet <laughs> and have il uh, 12 columns, right? You know, and then you have to figure out which column corresponds to constant of 0 and which column corresponds to bit 0 of the instruction register, bit, which one corresponds corresponds to bit one of the instruction register, and so on. Once you figure that out, once you have that kind of pictorial representation, you will know why this is FD0. Yep, so Ian is correct in that explanation. Very good. All right, 
So I think we are ready to have a control T, you know, um, a rising edge to update this location. So here's a control T and it becomes 7C, just like that. Isn't that cool? Now we have a falling edge and this time I'm going to fast forward. So this fa falling edge is going to increment the micro code pointer. So the micro code pointer will actually get to location FD1. But you guys would say, the once I type control T on the keyboard, you guys would say, but tech, you said blah, 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 because it doesn't seem that way. Okay, so here, you, here we go. Okay, here's control T. Don't blink. Control T, click. You go like, what? You know, tech, you said it's going to go to location FD1, but it went all the way back to location 000, 000, 000, 000 three zeros. What's happening here? Well, that has to do with the content at location FD1. So let's take a look at that content. And yes, this is really ugly because it gives me a gigantic window to look at all the locations in ROM. So let me just kind of resize it a little bit and put it into view here. All right, so we need to use a scroll bar to go all the way down to almost the end, which is at location FD1. So let's go to FD zero there we go so this location here is fd0 and this is location fd1 where we're supposed to be at so when you look at this location go like um that's a whole bunch of zeros except for one two so what is that one two what is that two doing here well first of all let's count the zeros okay how many zeros are we seeing here there are six zeros right so each zero is representing four binary zeros. So that means we have 24 zeros. So the least significant 24 bits are all zeros. So the question is, what is that two corresponding to? Which, which, which bit is a one? Oh, you cannot see the window, sorry. Uh, let me move it up like that. There we go. All right, so what do you think is the bit that is corresponding to the two? Well, if this is one followed by six zeros, that one would be bits 24. And since you know, this is a two, that means you know, the one is in binary corresponding to bit 25, which is the most significant bit of the output of the ROM. So when you, we switch back to the ROM here, the most significant bit of the ROM, which is bit 25, you can see 25 here. And we can track it down, right? So we tracked on this wire, which was a one when we got to location seven, I mean, FD1. It go, it's going into an OR gate. So if one input of a OR gate is a one, the output is going to be a one. And this is going to, guess what? The reset or the clear pin of the microcode pointer, which instantaneously changed the content of the register back to all zeros. That is why the microcode pointer went all the way back to zero, zero, zero. And it didn't take any time because you know, the reset of a register is what we call an asynchronous you know, operation. It doesn't need a, right, a falling edge in this case. It just happens. As soon as the uh, reset pin of a register is a one, the content of the register resets to zero like instantaneously. It doesn't need a clock event to happen. So we're back to location zero, zero, which means ah, we are ready to begin the next instruction cycle. We are ready to fetch the next opcode, decode the next opcode, and execute the next opcode. All right, so in the text channel, um, Ian said, so FD1 contains an instruction of, or a bit pattern, more like, a bit pattern that tells the microcode pointer to reset. Yes, that is correct. All right, so uh, we are almost running out of time for the class, okay? And I just got through one single instruction, but the LDI instruction is kind of, kind of the same way. Um, so in the interest of getting all the material that you need in order to do the uh, the lab, the lab has, has self-contained instructions as well, okay? So you don't have to have me to actually tell you everything. Um, so the important part is to go back to the opco table and look at LD and see what LD is going to do. So LD is closely related to ST because it's the opposite. So where's LD? LD is right here. So instead of changing the location pointed to by Y, 
to the content of x is going the opposite. Okay, it's doing the opposite, which means we are reading the content in RAM at location at the location that y is pointing to, and that content is going to be stored or updating register x. So it's exactly the opposite in terms of direction. Instead of overwriting a location of RAM using a register, it is basically reading the location of uh, reading a location of RAM and then use it to update a register. So that's exactly the opposite of the store instruction. LDI is kind of the tricky one. So there are two ways to look at what LDI is doing. I would just look at, I would just use this uh, explanation for now because the other explanation is a little bit complex and it is not needed, you know, in, in order to do your lab. So LDIXI is really just literally, um, you're storing the value of quote unquote what the I is into whatever the register, whatever X is, re is specifying as a register. In other words, um, one way to look at it Okay, let me just change the documentation here. So another way to look at this is simply x equals i. That's basically the most intuitive way to look at LDI xi. And i cannot be another register. i has to be a constant, has to be a numerical value. And then x has to be a register. So basically this is the only way to initialize the content of a register is to use LDI, load immediate. That's the name of the instruction. All right, so I'm gonna give you um, just a little bit more about you know, what is a byte, what is the byte quote unquote um, mnemonic, what it does, and also what is a label. Okay, so once we have talked about those two, your lab should be fairly easy to do. All right, so the byte thing is easy, okay? If you say byte, you'll know, say 23, it has to be a base 10 number. All that does is to initialize a, the next available byte to the binary representation of 23. So 23 is in hexadecimal 17 because it's 16 plus 7. So in terms of the bit pattern, it's going to be 0, 1, oh, excuse me, 0, 0, 0, 1. And then we have uh, 0, 1, 1, 1. But in, in hexadecimal, it is 1, 7. So when you look at the assemble you know, view, it is just 1, 7. It's just one byte, okay, 1, 7. Whatever you specify as the constant is the, the, the binary representation of this is going to be occupying the next byte. Um, you can also use a label. So label definition goes like this. This is a label definition. So what a label definition does is it provides you a symbolic name of the location that is corresponding to whatever this highlighted cell is going to be corresponding to. So let's just say that we specify a halt instruction here. A halt instruction has a, a opcode of 01. So with the label being defined here, it is basically the symbolic name of whatever is next to it or the address of whatever is next to it. So L1 is going to be, let's do a count, let's, let's do a count here. This is taking up one byte, this is taking up one byte. So this is taking up location zero, this is taking up location one, and this should be taking up location two. So this is why L1 as a label is nothing more than a symbolic name of the numerical value of two. Now, how do we know that? We go to the assemble view, and we can see how you know, when we have the label definition, the address is corresponding to location two. So that's that that's one way to find out what the value of a label is. Okay, you know it is corresponding to the address of whatever is taking up uh, memory locations after the immediately after the label definition. Now there's another way to find out what a label is, how a label is defined. And to do that, you have to go to a different tab. So you have to go to a sim tab tab, which is here. And this is in JSON representation or JSON representation, JavaScript uh, object notation. So it's a little bit harder to see. Okay, let me just kind of crank up the, uh, the magnification so you can see a little bit better. So I can see a little better. So we can see how L1 is defined on line two, and it is 
Um, so forget about RPN is reverse Polish notation. But what is after RPN, you know, this constant here is the value of the label. So this is how we can tell that L1 as a label is equivalent to the value of 2. That is all you need to know at this point about labels. So a label, once again, is a symbolic way to refer to a location of RAM. And the reason why we want to use um, labels is because sometimes, from time to time, we want to be able to refer to a location of something. So um, let me give you one more example, and I'll be, I'll be done here. I'll be out of your hair. So if I do LDI, A, and then L1, so what this is going to do is essentially it is just loading this LDI instruction. It's going to initialize register A with a value of 2 because L1 as a label is defined to be the address of whatever is right next to it, which is at location 2. So L1 is nothing more than just the numerical value of 2. So LDI A L1 is just you know, going to load a constant of 2 into register A. That is the effect of LDI. So LDI is basically just um, the only way to initialize the content of a register to a constant. But that constant can be spelled out as a nu numerical value. It can also be a label. It can be a bunch of stuff. You know, but at this point, we will just say that it can be a label or just a constant uh, of a number. All right. So, are there any questions at this point? And once again, you know, the explanation of what a label is and what it is used for is also in the lab. So, you know, it's not uh, it's not crucial that I have to you know, fully explain it in the lecture. All right. So, I am going to open up the lab, or at least give you the um, access code to the lab. So, let's go to. The lab is is named LDI, LDST and LDI. And let's see. <clears throat> oh, it is published. Okay, so we just need the access code, which is LDI itself. So LDI is the access code to tonight's lab. And the due date or the time due time is 9.50 p.m., just like just as usual. All right, so I think we are done today. Um, but before we meet again on Thursday, you know, um, I think it's really crucial to review how I dissected the operation of executing a single instruction and how the instruction is quote unquote created by analyzing the path, the necessary pathway and configuration of components of the processor. So that's really kind of crucial. The lab doesn't really quite help you do that. So it's that's a separate thing that you need to do. All right. So click save. You know, I didn't change anything. I mean, once you enter LDI as the access code, you should be able to get into the lab. All right. So I'm going to address a DM and see if this is something that everybody needs to do. Okay, that's a very specific question. I don't need to uh, address it to the whole class. All right, so are there any questions before I get out of screen share and live stream? Just want to double check before I get out of uh, Discord and live stream. And then I'll go out, go to eat something, and then I'll be back in about 10 minutes. All righty, I can see people are leaving. So it doesn't look like there are any questions. All right. So I will be back in about 10 minutes. And you guys, so don't try to rush through the lab, okay? Make sure you read all the instructions because it's that's part of the purpose of this lab. All right. So I'll see you in about 10 minutes.